Yo, what up? The GameStop thesis is super simple, but it's often misunderstood. Everyone classifies it as a cigar butt and then just moves on, but it's more than that. Yes, the legacy business is up against some very real secular risks, and the new consoles coming out this year might be the company's last hurrah. But this isn't some horse and buggy shit. GameStop is an established, uniquely positioned player in a thriving $150 billion gaming industry. And this is why GameStop is different. It's final puff. is a legitimate opportunity to reinvent itself as a premier gaming hub. Many investors assume GameStop will be forced to close its stores within a couple of years, so they're only focused on how much free cash flow this console cycle will bring in. It's a reasonable point of view, but it's incomplete. Investors also need to consider whether GameStop can opportunistically leverage the console cycle to transform into a more sustainable gaming-related business. And that, like, GameStop isn't a cigar butt. It's more of a roach, right? That last hit might not be the prettiest or the cleanest, but it could get the job done, if you know what I mean. It could get those creative juices flowing too, right? Over the next year, GameStop's new management team could uncover ways to engage its 60 million Power Up Rewards members and attract new customers to a more experiential type store. Are they likely to pull it off? I don't know. It could go either way. But so far, it kind of seems like they're on the right track. And when you consider what their balance sheet will look like 12 months from now, the opportunity is there. In my view, it's just a matter of execution. Fortunately, from the security analyst point of view, at a market cap of $260 million and an enterprise value of about $100 million, the downside is limited. Following major write-downs and balance sheet repair, their financial situation is pretty solid given the circumstances, with a reasonably fair net asset value of about $400 million. They just closed Q2, which will be another rough one, but following that, I expect earnings to improve significantly. Based on GameStop's market share, continued demand for its products, and management's improved cost management, there's a very good chance the company remains free cash flow positive over the next few years, which adds to the safety net. But let's also consider the upside, right? Over the next 18 months, GameStop could generate enough free cash flow to pay off its debt, exhaust its buyback authorization, and still have an adequate financial foundation to continue pursuing new revenue streams. These could include in-store gaming experiences and partnering up with vendors to showcase games. I'm willing to bet Reggie has a number of good ideas on this front. What's also interesting about GameStop is that it trades so cheaply and it's so heavily shorted that all that may be needed to revalue its stock is a shift in sentiment. Right now, the stock is pricing in the most bearish of bearish outcomes imminent obsolescence and management impotence. But GameStop is the only brick and mortar store dedicated to gaming. Suppose over the next year, management can craft a narrative that carves out a 2% share of that rapidly growing $150 billion gaming industry. One of the most exciting spaces in the tech landscape. A narrative that highlights an experiential niche backed by the biggest names in gaming. What then? Such a sentiment shift could take time, but I don't know. There's so many unusual factors with GameStop that I could see it happening rapidly. In summary of the summary, I'm just a security analyst in search of asymmetric upside. If it isn't clear, I'm not betting that GameStop is going to stage the most epic turnaround of all time. I'm just betting on three things. Number one, it's highly unlikely GameStop's equity is worth less than $250 million. Number two, GameStop's legacy business is probably worth between $500 million and $1.5 billion. And number three, there's a non-zero chance that GameStop successfully reinvents itself. And that's it for the summary. I'm curious to hear your takes on GameStop as well, so definitely share it with me in the comments of this video, or on Twitter, or during the live stream, or wherever, and then we can compare our line of thinking. All right, let's explore the different elements of the GameStop thesis a bit further. Now, if you've seen the other videos on my channel, if you've tuned into the live stream, you know I like to keep these walkthroughs light, so feel free to grab a beer. Although if you've been long GameStop over the past year, you probably have one because how else are you going to get through this position? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So first, let's just discuss why GameStop is the first video of this Kitty Corner series. And that's because it is now the largest position in the Roaring Kitty portfolio. If you've seen my other videos, you may have seen that I was already long GameStop. But over the past month of July, it's been trading below $4 per share. And as I dive deeper and deeper, it's looking increasingly compelling to me. So I've, the market's kind of forced my hand. I've just been adding more shares. And it's actually twice as large as the next position in the Warren Kitty portfolio anyway. So I thought I'd share my analysis. Maybe you can poke some holes in my thesis or catch some of my blind spots. But let's keep going. Let's start with some recommended reading. So if you want to learn more about the GameStop opportunity, first, I strongly recommend you check out Scion's letters to the board of directors over the past year. Scion, that's obviously a big short berries firm, right? They've had a position in GameStop for quite a while. And they've been sending letters to the board and to management, kind of expressing their views on how GameStop should handle its current situation. And earlier this year, Scion filed a 13D because they took a 5% position and within that 13d you can see other letters compiled into a single location so that makes it super convenient these are press releases too though so you can just do some google searches to check them out scion's latest commentary on gamestop was from a press release issued in early june we can see they were still a four percent owner of gamestop at that time and 
they were expressing their views on the board vote that was coming up that was coming up in June. And so check this out because it's the latest line of thinking. They do such a great job of boiling the thesis down and their thoughts to uh, just a few succinct, very clear paragraphs. And I really appreciate their line of thinking. So this is a great starting point. Another item you're going to want to check out is this Restore GameStop presentation. This was published in May 2020 by Hesta and Perma, two hedge funds that own about 7% of GameStop right now. And they published this because they were the ones vying for those board seats in June and they did get them. But this is like an 80 page presentation. I mean, how much can I add to an 80 page presentation? Not much, right? But it's super thorough and comprehensive. And it's an excellent uh, starting point for learning more about the background of GameStop as a business model, but also what its future could look like. And just from a general security analysis standpoint. Now, there have been so many articles written about GameStop over the years, countless, right? I'm losing track of everything, but there's a handful of them I definitely recommend checking out if you want to learn more about the GameStop opportunity. The first two are pretty similar. It's this one by Games Industry Biz and this one by IGN. They were published in February, March of this year. But what they're discussing in these articles are those concept stores GameStop was testing out in Tulsa, and they're in, they include quotes and interviews with the uh, GameStop executives. So... I don't exactly know what GameStop could look like, what their future business model could look like, but these articles kind of cover these things. You can get some insights into what's going through management's head. So definitely check these articles out. And another one is this article by Scott Preston of Maven Group. It was published in Barrett's in February of this year. He approaches it from a, a somewhat similar perspective where he's covering what GameStop could do uh, in the future, different ways they could approach their current situation. But he approaches it from more of a security analysis standpoint. So like, all right, here's what the business model could look like. Is there an investment opportunity here? And he does a great job of, of covering all these items much better than I could. So I really appreciate this article. It's definitely it's one of the best, most comprehensive security analysis articles out there on GameStop. So a must read. And just generally, I mean, Seeking Alpha, many times you'll be analyzing a company to check out Seeking Alpha because you want to see what other people are saying about it. And sometimes there's just not any articles published or the ones that are published suck. And I got to say, there's a ton on GameStop and, and many of them are very good. I'm really impressed and I'm biased, but in my opinion, the bullish ones are, they, they, the bullish authors, they seem to be much more aligned with reality than the bearish ones. That's just my take. Maybe you disagree, but I feel like the bulls are much more security analysis types and the bears are more maybe just focused on industry headwinds and so forth. So just my take. Let me know if you disagree. The next item I want to touch on is the whole cigar butt angle. Many people, when they're talking about GameStop, they describe it as a cigar butt and they go, eh, that's not for me. And they just move on. And there's definitely some truth to that, but I actually think GameStop's a little bit different than the traditional cigar butt that most people think about. And here I have up a PDF from TilsonFunds.com. This apparently is a talk that Buffett gave to MBA students at Florida University in 1998. And in here, he describes the traditional view of cigar butts. They got one last puff, maybe one last round of free cash flows, but thereafter, there's nothing more to be made. Either the business model is no longer relevant or the industry is dying and so forth. But this is where I think GameStop's a little bit different because this isn't just some horse and buggy industry, right? This is a thriving, rapidly growing gaming industry. And here I have an article from Newzoo, newzoo.com, where they talk about the size of the market. They estimate over $150 billion this year, rapidly growing to over $200 billion in just a couple of years. And so this is what I mean. The backdrop here is very promising for a company like GameStop. But this begs two questions, right? The first is, does a sustainable niche for a company like GameStop even exist? And the second is, if it does exist, is it possible or likely that GameStop can transform into a business model that actively grows alongside the industry? And the truth is, I don't know. But with this new management team and the new board of directors, at the very least, it kind of seems like they have the vision and soon they're going to have the balance sheet to subsidize that vision. And this brings me to my next point is that this console refresh is a tremendous opportunity for GameStop to reinvent itself for two reasons, right? The first most obvious one is that the increased gaming demand will bring in more free cash flows, right? That's an important component of any investment thesis. But these increased free cash flows will give GameStop the flexibility it needs to potentially reinvent itself. And the second aspect is testing. They can leverage the increased gaming demand to test out a whole bunch of things. They can test out new business strategies pursue new revenue streams, team up with vendors, revolutionize its omni-channel experience, trial new marketing approaches. Perhaps most importantly, they can re-engage its 60 million Power Up Rewards members and the broader gaming community. Now, that's the thing. I don't know what this testing would reveal, but it's at least possible that management could craft a new narrative based on this testing that would get investors' attention. This brings us to our next point is what the hell would that narrative even look like, right? I have no idea. I'm not smart enough for that shit. But other people have some really good ideas. And so to get us started, here's a couple of slides from that Restore GameStop presentation I mentioned. And I'm not going to read each through each slide, but it brings up a couple of good points. Like how can GameStop think beyond its, its current footprint to, to reestablish itself, reinvent itself? Like the fact that gaming is, is, is growing increasingly more social, can they tap into that? I mean, they have all those 
uh, power up rewards members too. Can they re-engage them, find ways to get them involved? They get the Game Informer magazine too. And it's just a question of how can they build a strategy around these core gaming assets, right? So read through these slides. This is a good starting point. And I mentioned those other articles too, like this IGN article. Like it's got some photos here of the experimental stores. I'm not going to go through each one. I'm, I know I'm blocking some of it too, right? But you click through this, like a lot of this shit looks pretty damn cool. I don't know if everyone agrees with this, but um, it, it's, it's a, it looks like it could be a step in the right direction. I'm not saying that this is this is a solution or anything like that. It just, as I look through this, it kind of reminds me of Apple stores and stuff. Yeah, check out this whole IGN article. There's a lot of great quotes from Frank Hamlin, the chief customer officer at GameStop. It gives a lot of great insight into where GameStop's head is at, like where some possible paths. And hearing it directly from GameStop, that's super helpful. Kind of plant some seeds in your head. Doesn't mean it's going to work out, but it's, it's helpful to understand where they're going. And if you scroll down here, there's a great graphic in this piece as well that lays out those Tulsa stores. You can kind of see what they're testing. They're, they're tapping into esports, in-store game rentals, and some other social aspects. So check this out. It's a great article. And same goes for this article as well. Again, it covers a lot of the same topics. So definitely check these out. And then that Scott Preston article as well. Here's some of the things Scott touches on in his article. You know, things like vendor partnerships where gaming publishers could team up with GameStop to showcase their new games, give people an opportunity to test them out, you know, build excitement and so forth. He mentions how maybe GameStop could team up with the publishers too to kind of act as a trading house for used digital games. I thought that one was kind of interesting because I don't know how that would work. Um, game programming. Kids might come to GameStop, learn how to program games, develop games and so forth. People could come to play Dungeons & Dragons, eSport minor leagues, pro gamers. And everyone's watching. Um, people stream online via Twitch and YouTube and so forth. Maybe there's something there. Just general trying before you buy, you know, like an Apple equivalent within the gaming industry. That kind of seems compelling. So I don't know how likely any of these are, but what sticks out to me is that there are appears to be many ways to skin a cat, if you will. And this is important because with increased attention on gaming over the next 12 months because of the new consoles, it does seem possible that management could succeed and at the very least crafting a new narrative that could get investors' attention. Now we've discussed the possibility of GameStop reinventing itself, right? Maybe you don't think it's probable or even possible, but I think we can all agree that if they did succeed in transforming their business model and investors started viewing them as a potential growth opportunity within the thriving gaming industry, then forget about it. That stock's going to be revalued significantly higher. Higher, right? Even if there's only a small percentage chance of that happening, that upside could be so tremendous that it would make it worth the investment. So now what we have to think about is the downside, right? This is the duty of the security analyst, in particular the value investor, is we need to make sure that our downside is covered. And this is the asymmetric upside that we're pursuing. And herein lies the downside protection, right? The stock price trades at about 60% of book value, about six, seven dollars per share. And if we pull up the balance sheet, and if we were to go through line by line, we'd see, first of all, that there's about $435 million in book value. And if you go through, it kind of looks like it's a reasonably fair estimate of what book value is. Uh, and the first thing is, if you look at year-over-year -year decline in book value, there's already been major write-downs. Those write-downs have occurred. doesn't mean that there we couldn't still see some, some losses moving forward. We, this is for Q1, the end of Q1. Q2 just ended. Q2 is going to be a rough one, but they're doing a sale leaseback transaction and generate some cash that way, I think, which could neutralize any cash burn for this quarter. And hereafter, I do expect earnings to dramatically improve looking out 12 months from now. So um, if this is a good starting point for book value, I like where we're starting. And if you go through line by line, you see cash of 570 versus a market cap of 260. It's like, what the hell is going on here? But obviously, that's a high quality asset. Even inventories, I know people knock GameStop's inventory saying it's lower quality, but a couple things. Number one is look at the year-over-year -year change in inventory. They've been trying to improve their working capital management as possible. They've kind of got rid of some of the garbage inventory they have and have some better stuff on the books. But also, if you, if you pick apart the footnotes of the balance sheet and the 10K, it kind of looks like that a lot of the inventory is is higher quality stuff like newer consoles, newer games, or games that came out within the, only the past three or four years. And that stuff is is a pretty good value, right? I mean, it will probably still be discounted at a fire sale. Um, but that's it just if you just try to back out what that inventory is, it kind of looks like it's higher quality stuff. And then even the used stuff, though, remember, this is carried on the books at cost. And GameStop pays very low prices when they're when you're trading in a game and then they mark it up accordingly when they're when they're selling it. So it's carried at cost. So it's carried at those discounted prices. So something to bear in mind. And then you see the usual stuff and, and the current assets and stuff and, and property equipment. That's probably where that uh, those distribution warehouses are that they're doing the sale lease back on. So it's possible they, they, they net a gain there. I'm not really sure. We'll see. And also Game Informer is another asset that they have. And I don't know. It's probably there on the books too. I don't know what that's worth. Uh, it, it's tough to value, but it's just another lever they could pull in theory. Then you take a look at the liabilities and the liabilities are fair, right? They usually are. They did an important bond exchange, which isn't reflected on the balance sheet just yet, but that was important because it extended the maturities of, of, of some of their debt and got rid of some important covenants. 
And then, I mean, those bonds, they trade at a discount right now, but if the company were to try to buy it back, that discount would probably disappear. So not worth exploring seriously during this video anyway. Um, but yeah, as I go through, it kind of looks like 435 is is pretty reasonable. And so when I see the market caps at 260, I think, all right, there's the first margin of safety that sticks out to me. Now, if we go back and we take a peek at enterprise value of about 104 million, um, and then based on my estimates, I do think the company is going to generate EBITDA of over 100 million over the next 12 months. So then when you're looking at an EV to EBITDA of less than one, you don't see that too often, especially with the balance sheet that looks like this. So that's like, whoa. I mean, we get it, right? It's because of all the negative sentiment, but still. And then I'm looking at just the sheer level of revenues, right? Six billion in revenues at the tail end of the console cycle. I know people are focusing on the year over year decline, right? And that's important is like, is this trend going to continue? But um, I mean, when you're trading at, it's trading at about 4% of those revenues, that's a tremendous amount of operating leverage in that if they can turn things around or just stabilize things, then the upside could be meaningful on that front. And so that's it, what I mean. It's weird to see a stock trading so cheaply like with so much operating leverage with this strong of a balance sheet. It's, it's pretty unusual. This is the opportunity. And we talk about margin of safety and how it historically performed, right? If you take a peek at simple free cash flow, operating cash flow less CapEx and how they how GameStop performed in the first three years of the last cycle. The company generated uh, about $6 per share using the current share count of about 65 million. They generated $6 per share on average over those first three years of the last cycle. Yes, I know historical performance is not necessarily indicative of future performance, right? It's not lost on me. But I'm just saying, $6 per share per year in the previous cycle, they just need to perform a fraction, I mean, 10%, 20% of what they did last time. This is what I mean. It's like you get that starting net asset value and then moving forward, they could generate quite a bit of free cash flow these, these next few years. And so this is kind of what people are questioning, right? Is there still even short-term demand for GameStop products? And I think absolutely yes. I, I think that's a, a weak argument. There's no denying that the, I mean, performance will, uh, will not be as good this cycle compared to last cycle because of the shift to digital, uh, because of increased competition. I mean, there's fewer games too because there's more blockbuster games, right? And that's hampering GameStop's business, something to consider. But I still think there's going to be demand for physical games generally, but GameStop's products, I think it's going to persist for at least a couple of years. So I pulled up a couple of graphics here to illustrate why I think the short-term risks related to GameStop's legacy business are a bit overblown. But before I even get to these, I'd just like to point out how in Q1 of this year, we had, we're battling a pandemic, right? and GameStop literally had to close its doors, and we're also at the tail end of the console cycle, and still GameStop generated a billion dollars in revenue during that quarter, which that sticks out to me. It's like, all right, there's still demand. GameStop's still relevant in today's day and age. But anyway, um, I got a couple of slides here from the GameStop presentation. So you can see here that physical still makes up a good chunk of purchases, even in 2020. I mean, the trend is declining, right? But it's still quite high, still higher than digital, still over 50%, and that's good news for a company like GameStop. And you see in this survey below, people continuing to express interest in physical discs. They still see the value even in 2020. And I like this this uh, quote from Phil Spencer. He talks about how the next consoles will have a disc drive because millions of people still want them. I mean, this is Xbox saying this, right? Who am I to say otherwise? And what I'm also trying to assess along these lines is what is the prevailing sentiment out there? So I'm checking the GameStop subreddit, right? I'm asking family and friends and they all think I'm crazy because they're digital all the way. But I'm also checking YouTube videos of people comparing physical versus digital. Here's just a handful of these videos. There's a ton of them out there do a youtube search but these folks they're weighing the pros and cons of physical versus digital and it's interesting to listen to because many of them they're making the case for both sides right but many of them lead more toward physical and you can see that based on some of the titles here like do not buy digital version kind of telling right and i also include a video related to the nintendo switch it's a couple years old but there's over a million views and there's still demand for physical games for the Nintendo Switch as well. And that's relevant because the Switch is a super popular system. And a lot of people buy their stuff from GameStop for that as well. But not everyone is pro-physical, right? I feel like you can kind of find whatever you want to find to make your case here. That's important to remember. Um, so I, I got one here in the background. Uh, this gentleman here, he actually prefers digital. But if you scroll down to the comments, it's kind of fascinating. Close to 100% of the comments, at least the comments uh, at the top, uh, are pro-physical. And what I'm doing is I'm taking this information and I'm trying to piece together the narrative, you know, and I'm never super confident in this type of analysis. But in the case of GameStop, I just need to be sure that there continues to be demand for its products, at least for a couple of years. And from what I can tell, that seems to be the case, especially because GameStop still has quite a bit of market share, even in 2020. So here's two more graphics from that same Restore GameStop presentation. In the first one, I mean, they're highlighting the fact that GameStop's losing share. But I see this and I think... It still has 30% share. That's pretty good because the consoles are here. It's likely they'll continue to maintain market share at least a couple of years out. 
And then this lower one, you still see that GameStop still has mind share with customers too. That's what I mean. I'm just trying to says is GameStop still relevant? And these types of charts seem to indicate that that's the case. So we're talking about whether or not there's going to be adequate short-term demand to ensure that there's downside protection for GameStop. It really seems like there will be because GameStop should be able to generate quite a bit of free cash flow looking over 18, 24 months. And this argument is further supported by the fact that I think there's going to be pent up demand for these new consoles and games for a few reasons. The first is that I just think people will be eager for new technology following a full length console cycle. And also Microsoft and Sony announced their consoles a full year earlier than they usually do. So I suspect that some consumers and game developers probably pump the brakes in anticipation of a new platform. There's also going to be twice as many games released alongside these consoles as compared to the last cycle. And finally, gaming interest has skyrocketed as a result of the pandemic. And when you combine that with the possibility of GameStop reinventing itself, even if you believe there's only a 10 or 20% chance of that, if they succeed in carving out a sustainable niche, whereby they can grow alongside the thriving $150 billion gaming industry, well, shit, that's the type of asymmetric upside I'm looking for. And that makes for a tremendous investment opportunity.